So today we're scrutinising Maestro by Bradley Cooper as part of our Oscar series. Masterful biopic or vanity project? Let's find out. So today we are going to be discussing the biopic Maestro, starring and directed by Bradley Cooper. This average film um, concentrates on the life and times of <laughs> Leonard Bernstein. Hey, listen, we're going to give a little hint of what I think early on, and then I'm going to give my final review at the end, so stay tuned, everyone. Um, it's the life and times of uh, comp- the American composer Leonard Bernstein, looking at um, how he got to where he is, how he made a name for himself, but also looking and exploring his personal and sexual life a- as well. Um Especially at uh, at that those times when when was it based? Is it nineteen forties, fifties, sixties, round about there? Well, he's he's born in nineteen twenty, I think, from from what I remember. Yeah, so it, it's just looking at the times of this American composer who, you know, he he was a big name, Leonard Bernstein, and he did have a from my research and films that I watched, he does have a lot of influence over movies and music in general. So that's what the film Maestro is about. A, a brief summary there, but it's just about the life and times of the American composer, Leonard Bernstein. And guess what, guys? Guess what I've learned? As a novice, I'm getting on to the next level now. Film is recorded in 35mm. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> guys, it, was, it was using a Panaflex, I think. By, Panavision, by Panavision Millennium, or... apparently. Well, this is okay. something interesting, oh, nice. though, because I made a note about this, and it's interesting that you interesting that you bring it up because remember last um, episode we discussed um, I mentioned the Jobs movie by Danny Boyle and I said that as that goes through that sort of they, they, yeah. they of use Apple, different different size sort of uh, yeah they use different they even go cameras, to like yeah. digital yeah and with this obviously they do I don't want to say similar because it's not really similar but along the same lines thing of obviously it, it, it starts off almost like a kind of golden age Hollywood, like pre-golden age. It really does, age. very 50s. Um, Even the aspect ratio 50s, is like four, four to three, yeah. And, yeah, I was going to say we're in black and white, the aspect, yeah, exactly. And then obviously we're going in because I think it ends, I think in the 90s, judging by his life, or late 80s. Late 80s, um, roughly, because he died in 1990, he, I believe, yeah. Oh, so there you go, so about 80s. And obviously we get to that kind of... Um, to that kind of look and I actually think because it's it's um, Matthew Liberty so it's someone who's quite a yeah, yeah esteemed cinematographer yeah um he's obviously he brings his skill to to you know to the screen but uh, I don't really know what was the rationale behind going from that sort of look to I, I don't know but to be honest gonna... I think the cinematography saves the f- saves it it is not it's not saved I was gonna but the say, cinematography yeah. is 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 one of the elements which is actually a little bit redeemable I, I, I quite like the long yeah. takes and the well that was the, gonna be one of my this... questions what did you guys think of the cinematography because I liked it I liked seeing it from at the different stages I thought it was very good and the fact mm. that I can clock mm. on 35 millimeters like that now, you know okay. what I mean? It was a yeah. big plus for me. But what did you guys well, think? If, 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 so, if anyone doesn't know, uh, Matthew Libertique, I believe is, is a lot of his early collaborations, um, well, his first film was Pi. His early collaborations yeah. uh, with, um, Dennis, name's eluding me. Uh, is is it Aronofsky? Uh, Aronofsky, exactly. Yeah, Reckon yeah. for a Dream. And so he, he's, he's, I mean, he's, him a and very Aronofsky visually are... esteemed sort yeah. of cinematographer. He, 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 he can create a, a really visually powerful look given yeah. the right director and he's super experienced i mean liberty is someone who obviously he's he's Aron, aronofsky's kind of i mean we met, we mentioned collaborators last time but they're big time collaborators i think they've pretty mm. much done everything together the Fountain, i think and yeah mother and stuff. yeah from early years you know it's back when aronofsky was doing very indie stuff to now but um and, and liberty i think he's even done he hasn't done Avengers. Did he do a Mar- did he do a Marvel film or something, something like that? But he's that. he's 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 journeyed, right? He he's bringing with him like you know he he's got the experience, and and you have to. So someone like um Bradley Cooper, um clearly he he seems to think of himself as a director extraordinaire, which in my opinion he <laughs> isn't. But um he needs to have Ooh, someone. Obviously, his lack of his lack of uh, imagine he writes in. Imagine he's like, dear Dennis, um. Mm. Yeah, he, it's he funny needs to say that Bradley like come in. Come in. He needs no, to have uh, <laughs> this is Ellen DeGeneres like <laughs> you're <laughs> cooking him up for me. Um 
but yeah, he needs to have someone like that. But I mean, yeah, to, in terms of save, I mean, you you retracted it yourself, but I wouldn't say it saved it. It's it's a positive of the movie, um, mm. along with something like um, obviously things like the makeup. It's done mm. well. They haven't mm. gone for any kind of nonsense aging kind of um, digital attempt. Yeah, yeah. Um, that just, stuff just to works pick up, well. pick up on that, the the makeup has been nominated for makeup oh really um and that's actually a category in itself which I, i'll be honest i didn't actually know about yeah so um it, it's and the, the makeup we can agree he actually fucking looks like burn bernstein especially yes. from bernstein especially from a distance yeah you have the bradley cooper eyes but apart from that it's pretty accurate the, the yeah that, that part stands out and i mean especially when you're obviously they use a lot of i mean the cinematography helps it along because they do mm. shoot it in this kind of very original of the time kind of look but um that is probably one of the standout things that the mm. makeup especially when i went back and looked at actual videos of him um it it's crazy it's how pretty, kind pretty of, flawless yeah, yeah and plus if you're just it, looking within that category we, we yeah have to. and it's done in a way that works so naturally if, if if you bring this on to someone who doesn't know what bradley cooper looks like i don't think there's a sense of oh this person's in like full makeup right um mm. it kind of just looks normal um, but what, what what else is nominated for it? Yeah, for so I mean, what actually, categories is it nominated for? It's, it's got so it's got seven seven uh, nominations. Best picture, obviously. Um, best actor, Bradley Cooper. <laughs> yeah. I'll just I'll just I'll just laugh at that. <laughs> um, best actress, Carrie <laughs> Carrie Mulligan, and we will talk about her because she didn't save it, but she did a pretty good job. Yeah, and incredibly cute dimples. We can all agree. Mm. Those, those dimples. Mm. Um, best original <laughs> screenplay: Bradley Cooper and Josh Singer. Makeup, as we mentioned, it's also makeup and hairstyling. One little piece of information is is the um that category was invented in 1981 after The Elephant Man. The Elephant Man was the by oh, David really? Lynch, David the Lynch single film, yeah. film which brought which made that category because it's it's so. It was so we, good, we should do an episode on on that movie because one it, of the best films. Of so all time. good that film. Never. Um, um, right. But anyway, that's just a little aside. Uh, best oh, it's like the elephant Matthew man. It's like, it's like Pixar. Body thinks that's a Pixar movie. I've, I've <laughs> like, I remember it. Finding Nemo. Dumbo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Dumbo. <laughs> elephant man. <laughs> and then lastly, we have best sound: Richard King, Jason Ruder. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it's seven. So that's, that's quite hefty. That's quite a, a, a good amount of nominations, right? That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's we we did Oscar bait like. I think four episodes ago, and and mm. I mean, we can be pretty film, sure this is yeah, this Oscar, is Oscar, this is bait. Oscar bait, and so it's, it may as well the For whole sure. film may as, well, may as well be Bradley Cooper on his knees, being like, just just give me the Oscar, like give me something, like, even makeup, me, give me something. Don't make me go through, just give me the Oscar. Let's all. It's so hard not to day. think of this as just a big vanity project. It's really hard. I'm, well, I'm I mean, trying my best. We won't, but, we won't, uh, yeah, because obviously we're waiting kind of on Bardi's questions, but just to yeah. pick up on a few I of your. It's erupt soon. On a few on your nominations, like best, uh, or, uh, is it original screenplay, did you say? Yes, yeah, so. Uh, or adapted yes, screenplay? Yes, origi- origin- original. So screenplay. I don't understand. It's, why not, it's not counted as adapted. No. Interesting, but Barbie is. But even, even on that note, forgetting that sort of dilemma, but a screenplay for what, though? It's one of the most boring. I think it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. kick off the film. I think there isn't a moment. I can't really remember a beat until I think an hour in when he kisses the guy in the corridor. Before then, it may as well have just been. <laughs> it may as well have been the adverts, you know, before the Odin I, I mean, movie. I mean, there's quite a lot of like quick fire repartee and dialogue and stuff in the early party scenes, and it, it's kind of nodding to old Hollywood. The yeah, kind of like uh, the, the quick quips they have between each other. It's not. But nodding, then that though. kind of drops off a cliff, and it becomes slow shots, minimal dialogue. It's a weird sort of. The thing it's is, like there are films. mismatch. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but let's okay. let's go on let, with the question. Let me put on a question now for you. It's not something that I've written down, but I want to ask it now. But I, obviously, yeah. I know. My, but what is it? What do you think let this film down ultimately? Because one of the things that I had problems with is watching it. It gave too much information with regards to his sexuality, and not enough importance mm. on just how much of a genius this guy actually was. You know, because he was a a, a, a big deal. And he did contribute a, a, a lot. So it just, fo- for me, mm. it focused too much on his sexuality constantly and his wife. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a scene it where It does she... focus a lot on, on uh, Fel- Felicia, yeah. Mm. And I think it's just a bit unnecessary because there's a scene, right, where 
because we don't know much about his early life, where he was brought up, what his relationship was like with his father. But when he's, you know, basically naked, laying next to uh, to his future wife, he goes, let's just tell each other some secrets. You know, okay, cool. Well, I have dreams of killing killing my dad. All right, you go. It's it's just it just dropped on onto yeah. us that he had we've, this. We've all been there. We've, we've all been there. That old all... dream, right? That old chestnut. <laughs> but <laughs> she's probably thinking it's gonna be something cute. She goes, "Oh, I dreamed about killing my dad." Go on, your turn now. Yeah, but it's that's actually a... funny because there are little things dropped into the script which are never explored. So never. that's a good example. Yeah. Another yeah. another thing that's a good example is when he's getting interviewed, he talks about the sort of schizophrenia of being a composer and a conductor. One being outward and one being inward. Yeah, but that's never looked at either. Nothing. Yeah. We kind of just we kinda, the, the 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 camera and the screenplay and the whole everyone's attention just gets pointed towards his wife. This and is his domestic. This is the complete opposite situation. of where something like Oppenheimer does the complete opposite of where it just concentrates on the work. And this 100%. one, this Dude, one just I was about to say the same thing. This just concentrate on on his personal life. It's like listen, find the perfect middle. Find Oppenheimer, yeah, that's so true. Oppenheimer is it's all about his profession, almost too much so. This way, yeah, it's the opposite. It's the complete um, opposite. I know which one I'd prefer more because if someone's sexuality is not that as, as interesting as someone's work, so I think Oppenheimer does it slightly better. Yeah, but the only thing that I'll s- the only thing that I'll say though is that uh, Oppenheimer, uh, I think it's a, it's it's risky to call it a biopic in the same sense that that maestro is for, yeah. for two major reasons which is one is that maestro obviously tracks tracks in the sense of we go through a quite large chunk of his life um we explore it um regardless of depth we explore it in some way or another which is that he we we open up with him just getting his sort of first break and we end with almost like his final years and the movie is explicitly about that journey and about him obviously we focus on his wife for large portions of his life but obviously even that is done through the sort of prism of him but the second reason is that with Oppenheimer at the core of that film is obviously the the trinity test and obviously yeah. Oppenheimer is there almost just as a sort of reflection of that and obviously with that Nolan and we discussed it in the review but Nolan kind of um, plays with that sort of almost like science Oppenheimer trinity test America love triangle right um so they're doing different things. But to answer your question a little bit, I mean, what what does this movie get, I think, the most wrong? If we think back, because biopics for me are, they're always quite difficult to do, right? Because you, and, and actually something that I think that Oppenheimer does well is that you take someone's life who, unless they were a fly that lived one day, you're forced to navigate through loads of things, right? So it's like if you make a film about, um, let's say, Kennedy, you're going to think, okay, is it we're going to do the build-up of his death? Are we going to do his younger years? Are we going to do his sex life, his scandal, his this, his that, his that? Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much to do. You as a director, as a writer, and even going back to producer level, you've got to obviously pick, sharpshoot pick, okay, what do we do in this one hour? An example that I would give is if you look at the social network, for example, um, it, it it's a biopic in the sense of Mark Zuckerberg and his, obviously he's still young, at the point of that film being released, but um, it's a biopic done specifically through this court case, and it uses that court case to kind of extrapolate from it things about his like, life. Like an so, anchor point. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So we we have this court case to constantly, it's, it's like a bridge, and those sort of currents of Mark Zuckerberg going in and out helps us understand, obviously, the tech world, his character, um, the Facebook app, and so on and so forth. The thing that this film completely lacks is that it thinks it's completely empathizing with his character. But for me, I walk away from it feeling even more distant from that character because it tries so hard to grab onto these certain points in his in his life um, at random sort of intersections of, like you say, it. he has a point where he discusses being depressed and obviously we flirt with his sexuality, but we do it in a way where it's like, I don't even know exactly what he was into and what he did. Even though the, a chunk of the film is about it, we walk away not really sure what was going on. Um, obviously, we have that sort of Greek tragedy, the pathos of his wife being sick. And obviously, I'm sure when Bradley Cooper read it, that was like, okay, this is the sort of, this is the big moment, right? He does it in his other movie as well. Yeah. But aside from that, he's he just can't grab on. It's, it's air, right? He's just trying to grab air for the whole movie. And then what I... So I made a... I tried to obviously make a bunch of notes about things that sort of stood out. 
And you mentioned, Rowan, that there are obviously a few lines of dialogue and a few witticisms. I liked sort of certain points, like when he meets um, who we assume to be one of his lovers because he gets caught kissing him in the corridor. Obviously, his wife catches him, which mm, is probably yeah. one of the only sort of early moments where there's a bit of tension, right? He has like a funny line where he goes, oh, where did you come from? Did you come from my breast pocket? Um, did you, you know, you yeah, see him yeah. in a sort of flirtatious, rambunctious but then that character disappears for a moment. Um, and then we go through other things. He kind of emerges for a few seconds and he's gone again. Um, and it, for me, it felt more like it wasn't a conscious decision. It felt more like the director couldn't handle the subject matter. He's using these cover-ups of these static shots and a few things that he's seen in, you know, early 2000s art cinema. But ultimately, it's it's. Uh, I think it just collapses under its own weight of, you know, perceived gravitas do you think bradley cooper yeah. approached this film as if to say like people know who leonard bernstein is so they'll <coughs> know the story because when i'm watching it and the first scene is him slapping the guy's butt i think okay he, he's a gay guy and then he's about to get married to this woman you get confused as to what what's going on but the way he's done it bradley cooper as if like oh, you should know who he is already like you should have known that he has this kind of double life effectively because i was confused i was like i don't know yeah, but even that even that it, there's a way um there's a way to pull that off right there are ways to pull off that kind of uh, ambiguity if if you you know if you approach it in the right way yeah. um which i think this film doesn't because it if you do it, because this is what it feels like, and 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 maybe I'm being overly harsh now on on Bradley Cooper, because obviously from a performance point of view, he's he's obviously clearly a skilled screen actor, right? But yeah. for me, it feels a lot like he saw a video of um, <clears throat> Leonard Bernstein, and he's probably thought, "I can do a great impression of this guy," because for me, that's where it stops. I think that's where it feels like he got to that point, and he was like, "Okay, from this." Let's make a movie because the film is so clearly about Bradley Cooper. Same with The Star Is Born. The film is so clearly about him. The first shot is Bradley Cooper, and we end with Bradley Cooper. So there's no doubt in my mind that this is Bradley Cooper's attempt to just boost his star power, and he's obviously seen a bit of himself in his own pseudo, you know, bizarre way. He's seen a bit of himself, and then the Bernstein he's thought, okay, I'm gonna ride this wave to the end right and he's obviously thought all oh, the topic here is so grandiose but to me the film is nowhere near intellectual enough to deal with almost anything i mean it, it doesn't know how to touch on the war even though he lived through the second world war as a jewish yeah. person in america it doesn't know how to touch on um homosexuality properly um it spends about 15 minutes trying to be a marriage story and then i don't i don't even know what happens there um it turns into a bit of a cancer story it spends about 15 minutes trying to be as touching as possible you know yeah. um but overall it just feels like he just can't you know he can't deal with any of them so to me it's performance first bradley cooper first and then everything else hopefully it kind of comes together which in my opinion it doesn't yeah yeah i, I agree with with most of that the picking up on the performance we mentioned the makeup it seems like a lot of the emphasis was just getting him to look and, and maybe act, but a lot of it's just, just because you can mimic the, the guy you're doing a, a biopic of. Yeah. It doesn't really, really mean you're adding much. And yeah, exactly. I'll be honest, I kind of, when I'm looking at him, it just kind of seemed phony. The makeup itself, just on its own, was good, but I can see Bradley Cooper's face behind that. It's sort of like a, it's got this it's got birdie face. I can but just, I think that prosthetic nose and. But the phoniness, I think, comes comparing largely from that with the film, right? So I interrupt you, but I was going to say it comes because you can't ever get into the film. You're always yeah, it's yeah. always the Bradley there is Cooper that, but, show. But, but right? also, I will be honest, just on a visual level, I, I couldn't I couldn't get by the phoniness just of his face, the the prosthetic yeah. nose and, and everything. Especially but, as but it the, gets the, older. The, but the blame doesn't go to the makeup eyes. It goes with like, of course he's just no. badly cast. Honestly, no, I, I don't course. think he's. He, Firstly, he is, there are questions about, oh, he's not Jewish and they're putting a big Shylock nose on him. It's a bit weird. Yeah. 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 But, um, but I think there could have been actors who could do it, who could do it better. He didn't convince me a whole lot. Well, with regard to, to, to the nose, apparently um, Leonard Bernstein's kid came to his defense uh, when he was doing that, saying, you know, it's okay, it's, it's, it's for the role. And, uh, you know, he had that sort of permission to, to do that uh 
But should he still be doing it? That's a different question. But he had the okay. You know, it really annoys me. It really annoys me when something comes up, right, when it's, you know, it's a topic of racism. It's not necessarily the case. It's always true. But when something like racism or the way we depict other cultures and things like that, there will be people do this thing where, you know, sometimes there'll be YouTube videos where people like okay. interview like just, just like a random, you know, Mexican Mexican person just on the street and they were like, Oh, does this bother you? And the Mexican person's forced to be like, Oh no, it doesn't bother me. And they'll turn to the camera and be like, see, like what what's the big deal? That stuff really annoys me. His kids coming to the defense, yeah, big deal. They're not offended, fine. But I think the overall issue really is that um it's a it's a it's a tricky subject but if you if you go down that route of like Rowan saying like you're putting on a big nose and you're sort of okay it's it's acting which i understand but um it's like where do we i don't know where do we draw the line right is it like so do you do you then start to say okay i can maybe perform to this level i can do this character i can do this character no matter what the other implications are maybe not but to be honest i didn't look too much into the sort of jewish kind of nose issue Mm. just because the film was so bad that i just thought (laughs) yeah it it didn't interest me there wasn't enough it does have a bright cool wall in front of you at all times that you can never penetrate it can never just really enjoy who this man was and how much of a great artist he was because there's a Bradley I'm just, Cooper. I can wolf. just, I can just, I can see his just Bradley Cooper is like he's got a bit of a wonky face. He's got his like blue eyes. It's just his parroty face. It's just coming through too much. It's just, it's there <laughs> nibbling also, at me through the fucking screen. <laughs> also, when he's dancing like a pirate as well, when he's doing that sort of weird dance, yeah. like, just reminded me of Dennis for some reason. The sailor, why. the sailor. Oh, the sailor, so not the pirate, yeah. the sailor. Yeah. And he's just, he's got that hat and everything. He's, those, it just I tell really you what, weird. those, those opening pirate. scenes I don't know what the fuck well. came up with the pirate, the <laughs> <a> sailor. <laughs> <laughs> a sailor, okay, Captain Nemo, like, he's like in Jules Verne. If you're waiting for a, for a pirate scene, it's not going to happen. It's definitely not going to happen. But also with, with those, with those, um, with those uh, scenes that you mentioned, Barney, because we'll park the, the sort of anti-Semitic yeah. side of it, because I think it's, it, the film isn't good enough to warrant that argument, in my opinion. But, yeah, I, I agree um, with that. Yeah. But um, the, those scenes as well, especially, especially annoyed me, because um, I think, it, you know, you have early kind of 30s, 40s, 50s cinema, which you have some amazing pieces of art and then obviously it builds to, even we have things like following on from that west side story going into 60s 70s you have you know great musicals you know things things that i think you know i'm a big fan of cinemas re-releasing old films and and showing you know uh almost like cultural artifacts right of like as you said pieces of hollywood and so on but in this film it feels like the most ham-fisted cheesy interpretation of those things ever right because yeah. it will do these kind of like there's this one shot that I, I hated it so much where they walk through the theater and it's like a top-down shot and they're kind of like running across i thought at one point that i'd put it on two times speed i was like what exactly is, is it yeah the, the, the camera sort of flies through it? the the empty hall and it yeah. does like a three it does like a 180 it's yeah. obviously cgi'd yeah yeah it's a, it seems like a like a drone shot like but i thought speed. are they being are they being flippant here is it is it an in joke about something and or is it referencing something is it when his wife says uh oh, oh i just want to hear music and he goes well, we can't scene, just leave yeah, and she goes yeah we can and they just get up and leave for the dinner up, yeah. like, what the fuck are you talking about yeah and it's like you've <laughs> not doing? you've we not built up dinner. yeah that, that was such an anomaly it just <laughs> yeah. doesn't fit in any of it really. you're in a social gathering you go well we're but, just gonna this, leave it's like no this, this has actually film. brought me on to a, a criticism another kind of criticism which which the editing doesn't really seem to be synchronous it doesn't really work with the beats of the music or any of the mo- emotional that, that's also true it's, yeah i, I thought it's not, the editing is really it's not there's not much intuition with that it could have been done really well especially a film which is conceptually about music yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. didn't. I didn't feel. I wasn't. I wasn't ever. I wasn't well, ever know, propelled or c- compelled by the music. So for for people who have seen the movie Tar, which is I which think film? now Tar T A R with Kate, okay. Kate Blanchett, it's. I mean, it's worth watching, and it's a it's a great movie from I think a year or two ago, and I also think it was nominated for best picture. But I can mm. see Rowan's buzzing away there. He's like he's gonna find Tar I for me. Seen it. <laughs> um, 
really nice movie. I'm not going to say too much about it because for those who haven't seen it, go down and watch it. I don't want to spoil a film that isn't obviously the topic of this um, podcast. But that film is about a composer. And the film itself isn't about composing. Just a bit, a, a lot like Maestro isn't about composing. It's about a composer, right? And obviously the sort of trials and tribulations. But that film, it does something quite interesting. I'm not suggesting this film copies it, but it treats composing almost like, in, in, the, in the sense of Tar, her, her character, um, it treats it as her kind of, that's where she's free, right? That's her sort of mode of expression and so on. And it kind of breaks away from all the dramas that happen in the film. And it has got great drama but with this film again it obviously feels like he's been like oh i'm gonna do a great impression of leonard bernstein get that camera on me get me the best fake sweat get me the biggest like wrinkles and get me some great white hair i'm gonna uh, leonard bernstein the shit out of this right but he's married to leonard bernstein's ghost didn't you hear <laughs> and, they got uh, engaged last year and uh, <laughs> none of us were invited over you know so this podcast needs to pick it up so we start getting those vip invites but yeah and then and then you're watching it and you're like you guys know my favorite word right but it's like this is just cynical bullshit right this this beep, you beep, could beep, beep, beep. No, but you could easily, it, it, it feels like it feels like you know when people make up a company that like, i'm going to start a business and then go first thing i'm going to think of a name and it's like what's your business about don't worry about that i'm going to think of the name first and then we're going to do the business this film for me feels like the film equivalent of that where he's style like, of a substance he's own he yeah. he knows i'm going to play leonard bernstein well he's like, i'm going to get that oscar nomination i know it probably was like listen i know a few guys at the oscars i'll get the nomination just put me some makeup um what was his last 10 years of his life oh he got married his wife had cancer perfect keep it moving yeah it, it, yeah it, I, I hated it clearly so i mean i don't know if you have any more questions i do i, do. Just, I just wanted uh, to add one bit there's um there's an interview where bradley cooper is having with leonard burns uh, Sting's kids and he's talking about one of the first meetings that they have where Bradley Cooper's sitting with the kids and he's eating spinach with his hands and then he apologizes oh sorry I shouldn't be eating that and one of the kids turns around to them and says my dad used to do that and then he went oh maybe I can do this film then <laughs> that's that's all it took that's I, I, all I, it do took. you know what we shouldn't have even done this episode I think, <laughs> I think this is a I think this episode is a no, all it took was it's, it's, it's got seven nominations Seven so i nominations. think just for just for the, the 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 common good you know we we owe it to people we, we owe it to people the people are asking for it dennis they but want stuff your... like you know stuff like that right because if people remember when when jim carrey was playing um well people kind of know it's become infamous right this story but there's that whole thing of when he plays um andy kaufman and he um i think it's like there's there's even a movie of the making of the yeah. movie right yeah yeah um, yeah and he's like so in the character to the point of it's like he's gone insane, right? And Bradley Cooper thinks he's that. Bradley <laughs> Cooper thinks he's that. Bradley Cooper must wake up and be like, oh, like I had a dream that I'm pretty sure Leonard Bernstein had that dream. I think he deludes himself that much and he's given himself. But because to me, it's an example of why if you let the kind of sort of the really big players, people like yeah. obviously Bradley Cooper, who's you know he, he you know he obviously reached almost a star power peak you know, and he used that to go into directing if you if you become yes men to people like this you will end up with films like this because for me it's a bit of a because i can understand the nominations from a point of view of like we said you know the the makeup i'm sure they got some of the best people in hollywood to work on that makeup and i'm sure we mentioned matthew liberty nothing against him he's he does the absolute best with that material there's some great um, shots. I mean, there's one static shot where he's talking with his wife, and it's behind these kind of floral archways, mm, and it stays mm. on a static for quite a while. Any good cinematographer can work a static almost like it's a moving shot, right? Breathe life into yeah. it. Um, uh, obviously, going through the old sort of, we get that old black and Just white. Just interject. There's in. a there's a great shot of when he's composing, and you can see his shadow, and he's hitting his wife, who's kind of backstage. I thought that was a great shot. That reminded me of the um, Star Wars poster when the shadows over, um, uh, but it's like the shadow of 
Nah, you, you haven't seen. Yeah, seen um, it. Um, the next episode will be Barty watching the most basic fucking films that everyone has <laughs> <laughs> that everyone has watched. Um, uh, but I thought it was so a great shot of him composing. But, the, but that's what I mean. The, the, there's obviously people, so it's it's hard in a way to say this shouldn't win any Oscars, right? Because that would not be that would be doing a, a disservice to. Like we said, the people who worked on the makeup and yeah. and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, there are films where, like, I recently watched The Creator, which is nominated. I saw for a um, visual effects Oscar, yeah. and the movie had a few issues in terms of the story. But overall, a good film, but the visual effects are so amazing when you watch it on a big screen. Like they take your breath away in a way. So. Yeah, that film deserves. Um, well, look, we're watching uh, Poor Things next for next time, and we'll, you'll be. Well, there you go. If you haven't seen it already, the VFX are next fucking level, in my opinion. So my point is that if we're going from a technical point of view, nothing against this film, but clearly there's a kind of cult of personality here, and that is obviously Bradley Bradley Cooper. We discussed it a little bit with A Star Is Born. I mean, mm-hmm. actually, A Star Is Born. One thing it has going for it is it it has enough kind of pop culture presence there to keep it watchable a lot of young people will engage with it the presence of lady gaga obviously the the music as well right because the music that sells today isn't west side story it is lady gaga right so that film had a few more things going for it for me it was equally as dull and obnoxious as this but um with this it doesn't even have the drive of being interesting the story is uh, no disrespect obviously to the true to himself person but yeah. From a cinematic point of view, the story is incredibly dull, right? It doesn't treat anything with reverence. Um, Carrie Mulligan is obviously acting her heart out, but it's not treating her with, with reverence. I think when she watches that back and sees those scenes of her obviously going through terminal illness and so on, um, it just feels a bit parked to the side, right? She's acting her heart out on a topic that I'm clearly... I'm sure she obviously wanted to engage with fully. She knows the sort of you know the ramifications of being severely ill and so on and she's she she does the role very well but again the film kind of just steps over that you know a bit like when you're trying to get into the house quietly and you're like okay well let's get over this part cancer's done move it on um but but yeah, the film so, does does detour quite dramatically focusing on on the wife huge rather than bernstein and even the last shot is you see the the letters maestro and it's it's her instead of him. Yeah, she looks over at the camera. Um, even that though, it felt it ends. You know, it made me laugh when I saw the ending scene because it ends like a good movie. It, you would if like if someone told me, oh, this is the last shot of the film, I'd be like, oh, it could be a good movie then because it ends with a. Kind Visually, of, it looks like yeah. it should it should be destined to be a a, a great film, but it's just not. Uh, like, just, it detours uh, yeah. so much. Um, just putting but, makeup on the pig, sort of thing. Um, but <laughs> on, on the topic of of, of makeup, I just, <laughs> that's this is true. Um, on the topic of makeup, uh, me and the novices obviously get together once a once a week to talk about questions we're going to ask you. Um, and one thing that <laughs> the novice ooh, guild, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, we, we have I imagine tablets. it like in Fight Club, you know, when he just meets up with strangers to pretend they're all dying. It's all or all novices in a basement, <laughs> strapping yeah. it out. I'm just yeah. there going right. Well, who, who's got questions? You've got decent ones because I'm about to go up there and record. Um, but one thing that's always always interesting whenever someone is portraying another person in a biopic, or the question always comes up of how much they look about like someone. And no one really cares if they act that much. You know, we have, when we've spoken about it in the past, uh, the Jobs film with Michael Fassbender, who probably doesn't look as much as Steve Jobs as um, Ashton Kutcher does. But I think he probably does a a much better job. So what's more important to you? Do they have to go hand in hand? Or is it solely about the looks? Or is it solely just about portraying that person how they were? What's more important? To, uh, to you guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here, but it, it, neither of them are that important. Truth neither. be told, um, it, the film is the only important thing because anyone who's okay. seen anyone who's seen something like I'm Not There, which is the um, Bob Dylan movie, in which about I think five or six mm. separate actors play Bob Dylan, um, mm. or anyone who's seen films like. Um, uh, what comes to mind 12 years a slave is another one that comes to mind films where there is obviously a person is that a biopic then? um 12 years a slave it is yeah it's just the story of i mean that that um 
that whole film traces the life of that particular slave. Um, so it is, I mean, I would consider it a hmm. biopic. Um, but for you to ask, is it a biopic, kind of proves my point, because this is the point I was going to say, is that um, if you are doing a kind of a sketch show where you're going to imitate people, and it's like, oh, he sounds exactly like Denzel Washington, he sounds exactly like Morgan Freeman, um, then fine. But if you're doing, um, you know, some sort of, which in this case it feels like some sort of, I don't know, reenactment of certain moments, okay, but ultimately it's the film that will drive that character. So you mentioned the the Fassbender approach versus the um, Ashton, Ashton Kutcher, Kutcher approach. Yeah. Um, Fassbender and Danny Boyle clearly must have sat down um, w- with that film and said, look, these are the sort of, these are the points that we need to hit in terms of Steve Jobs' kind of, presence in that company the effect he had on that company um the way he treated people the way he treats his family and Fassbender was obviously chosen because he's he's very good at playing a kind of cold underlying kind of cold brutal sort of bitterness to him and he does that well in sort of the Prometheus films and and other things that he's done so clearly Danny Boyle has seen that this is far more valuable than just oh he looks like Steve Jobs or he can or he can go on the screen and do the sort of famous iPhone moment. He does it exactly like that. Um, the same, for example, with the social network. A lot of people in the beginning were saying, oh, he's not that much like Mark Zuckerberg. But what happens is through the process of that film, his kind of almost like malignant uh, kind of rudeness starts to sort of just trickle down. And obviously as the court proceedings go on, we find that, oh, what's that, the core of this issue is obviously his behavior and the way he treats other people and his kind of ruthless drive that he kind yeah. of pre- pretends to be oh, i'm just an introvert but actually he's he's a ruthlessly driven businessman right um so that performance is is spot on whether or not he looks exactly like mark zuckerberg is irrelevant because the film is structured in a way where once you fall into that world it's like great vr right once you're in that world you lose sense of what the real mark zuckerberg let's say looks like or the real Steve Jobs um, looks like. Same with a movie like Moneyball. Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, they don't really look like their counterparts at all. But it's a movie about how, you know, people who've who've seen it will know, but um, how things like maths and science and all these things affect. And the film has a, you know, laser sharp focus on those, um, on those topics. And they use, they've obviously clearly chosen Brad Pitt for, he brings a kind of charisma. He shields Jonah Hill's character that that balance works well so for me it's is completely irrelevant this whole thing of they look alike they don't look alike you know because unless that character is able to bring the energy unless the director finds something in that character and this is why it comes back to that cynicism of, of this movie with bradley cooper unless you're able to find why am i making this film what is it about this character that resonates today that resonates with the script that i've written that resonates with audiences today if you can't find that then you're going to end up with for me, a film like this that falls pretty much on its face, and it obviously does a disservice to someone who clearly was obviously a genius in their in their field. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but what's interesting? Apparently, the the family was heavily involved in in this biopic, so they probably even if I, I like initially they wanted to put things in the script, they might have been taken out just to protect his name, sort of thing. Probably, even that, probably that's, ha- hampers that's, the process quite Yeah, well. that's what because that's a kind of double edged sword, right? People sometimes do that to protect the image. Obviously, we mentioned the nose and the potential anti Semitism. Um, not to say that I think that's the case, but be- things like that end up being kind of marketing voodoo, you know, to say, oh, look, we contacted the family. And obviously, like you said, it, if it is true, it tends to be the case that they will remove a lot of the juiciest stuff for example there's a michael jackson biopic coming out i think antoine fuqua directs it um mm. and my understanding is that the family is heavily involved in that so f- based on that it probably won't be the fact that he's gonna <laughs> molest the kid right <laughs> and we don't know that for sure either do we oh. listen uh all i'm saying is in that movie he probably won't molest the kid so you mean yeah he probably so what, I, I don't want to, you know, let's wait for the movie. Maybe Fuqua <laughs> slips that scene in. <laughs> but, you know, the family's probably like, listen, the, 
<laughs> the kid was just tired. The kid was sleepy. You know, he had nowhere to rest. <laughs> he had alcohol in his system. It doesn't matter. He would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just the, the, the new Dunkin' Donuts uh, vodka donuts. You know, that was all. Why it is was, he getting a pay out if, he, if he's innocent? Don't worry about yeah. it. Just mo- keep it moving. It's about Listen, the, music. the other twenty beds. Look at the moonwalk. Have, Look at the moonwalk. They didn't have bed sheets fitted. There was only one bed in the house that had bed sheets. The other twenty didn't have bed sheets, it and it happened single... to be Michael's bed. On a double and no, it just people relax, fit. okay? Uh, Fucking hell, people just not giving Michael Jackson a break, right? Yeah, <laughs> no smoke without fire. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great music though. Great music. Still listen to music today. Yeah, but you know, it's just if I had to choose, don't make the music or molest kids. Uh, I think I'd just like don't make the music. Twice. I mean, just this leave, is a different just leave topic. The kids alone. Different topic. We're talking about <laughs> Bernstein here, okay? Who? <laughs> Yeah. Also, people who just tune in now, they were like, Bernstein, the molested kids? What's going on? <laughs> Bernstein and Michael Jackson, what did that a little crossover? Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, though, because I know so little about his life, I don't know what they could have potentially left out It was if that was the case. But judging by the sort of feel of the film, um, it looks a bit like... Because they even... That's another thing. They're a bit, in my opinion, they're quite cavalier about things like homosexuality um, and... Because let's not forget, I mean, this is, uh, this is if we're talking 50s, 60s, 70s sort of period, um, that film makes homosexuality seem like it was the most chill thing ever. Like, he's out there, he's like in the public and kissing and grabbing. And I'm thinking, when I was watching the movie, I was like, was it like this? I'm not too sure if that's the case, because it's not really like that now. It's, it's so, so um, normalised. Even, even yeah. Felicia doesn't really comment that badly on it. But there's actually a, a scene where he talks to the baby, says, I've, I've fucked both of your parents. Fu- I'm yeah, raining it my- in. I'm raining it in. He says I'm crying. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. What can I do? That is um, such a weird... Also, why does um, his wife, Felicia, why did she jump in the pool at one point? I didn't really understand that bit. Yeah. Because Beyonce bit- did it in a music video and it's become a trope for depressed women. I'm asking that's the a serious reason- question that the novices are no, asking me to ask and you're taking the <laughs> piss left, right and centre. <laughs> for me, that's just a trope. That's just lazy. It, it, is, it is a lazy trope. It really it's is. Very, yeah. Yeah. It's very weird. I just saw it. I was like, what the fuck? I thought you were confused. Utterly confused. Yeah, even the way that's shot, that scene is a bit... Um, it feels so inconsequential, the way it's shot. And then you kind of watch it. And you, but it goes back to the thing that we said, where there's a point where he says well, he's outside and he's all elegantly dressed and he's smoking. I mean, every scene, <laughs> someone is smoking. I don't know what... The, every single you know, scene, he has a cigarette. I every don't know what um, the FDA makes of this movie. But um, uh, he says things like, oh, I'm deeply depressed, right? And I was like... Okay, I was like, but not in this movie, you're not. I was like, in this movie, you're fine. Right? It's completely <laughs> random. It's completely you're like, incongruous. You're like super point. chill in this movie. Like, I don't he's know what slapping, you're... He's slapping every guy's ass. He's fucking making yeah. quips. Oh, yeah, especially think... when he's like in old age and he's dancing with that new conductor who he teaches. That's such a weird What's scene. What's funny is I, I paused that film halfway through. I did something else and I came back to it. I, it was a t- different fucking film. Yeah. <laughs> He, he looks like, like nothing like the earlier film. The lo- that, but, what that that scene? He looks like like Johnny Knoxville was imitating him from something like, also, from, like Bad Grandpa. I, I, like, uh, yeah, for sure. That's, I that's really, good, yeah. I actually really liked. I actually really liked the potential of 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 that scene. So when he's so for people who maybe don't remember, obviously towards the end of the movie, um, yeah. we see him in his sort of. I want to call it latter years. We we never really told exactly how old he is, judging by makeup and prosthetics. He's obviously. I would say post retirement age, right? Um, and he's teaching this young, um, this, this young conductor. He's giving him a bit of tips, and there's this great kind of, there's a great comedic moment actually where people applaud. He does that for me. He goes louder, louder. For me, yeah. there's a great movie there. If I'm in the script writing table with the guys planning it, and Scorsese's there, Spielberg's there, and they're like, you know, you know, um. Bradley Cooper's there, full makeup. 300 million. No, I was going to say the budget of the movie, 100 million or whatever. They said, here's the money. What are we doing here? I think that period is a great period to to focus on. We're going through the sort of the twilight of his career. We're moving into an era where that music's nowhere near as popular as it was. If you look at, you know, post-war 50s, kind of um, that dominance of that style of music and why someone is a conductor and is famous. I mean, name a conductor today. I can't. I don't even know a single conductor, right? Um, mm. Um, so to see him sort of shift out, train a new generation, and it, it's nice the fact that that new generation, um, I think it's a young black guy. I'm not, I can't remember exactly, but you yeah. can see there's various people that would have been, I think, a great 
sort of you could still hark back and i'm getting into it like we're fucking brainstorming a new movie but that would have been a great way to kind of explore that character but what happens instead is a bit like a kind of hbo special of like the sort of hits of his career you know sort of thing mm. which it, they try to do so much i mean not to repeat but they try to do so much and you don't really get anywhere right but that moment i think had potential and i'm not saying bradley cooper necessarily needs to play him because i'm sure there's people of that age that could do a great job um um not de niro because he's only 45 i think based on killers of flower moon but <laughs> for someone who's older um but that i thought was an interesting because his dynamic with young people actually works well and it's one of the standouts of the actual story and plot of of the film and obviously he could, he could use that to look back a, uh, after the fact of you know his, his wife's passing and his children and so on but no instead the film decides to just cram that into like 10 seconds i think there's like yeah. one good flirt scene there's that scene dribbled a few i mean even his interactions with his kids i didn't know if they were his kids or what like at one point they're like four and then they're like 30 um well, but he, he hasn't in. aged that much oh who's left snoopy here oh, okay oh the snoopy <laughs> scene i made a note of that snoopy scene because that that is almost but, like... and, then, and then snoopy becomes like a big float going through the window yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, while they're that? while they're like because she walks off and they've just had a fight and it's supposed yeah. to be like this kind of big like climactic fight and he just stood there and it's like a big snoopy which i was like it's, it's almost like a dark it's like a joel cohen film it's like dark comedy here um but uh, yeah but one anyway thing, body obviously more questions please more questions please but yeah what i was gonna <laughs> say was it does miss quite big chunks of the actual composer's life because you know i don't you may know some composers but you don't know a lot of people who are conductors you know worldwide famous conductors you know if you had to list five you probably struggle to come up with because not people are really tapped into that uh, to, to that industry but he was one of them especially for that time who had worldwide success and yeah. one of the reasons for that uh, was because not only was he a talented musician but he also s was fluent in several languages so English, French, Italian German and Hebrew and that's how he communicated with audience oh, musician, musicians around the world so it decides to completely skip that fact and just concentrate on more about his wife having cancer yeah I mean I, I saw some YouTube videos just before we, we started of him talking in German about the way to these sort of uh, vocalists and stuff so yeah, yeah. The, having having more of that interaction like sort of that, that live interaction or, or interaction with, with people musicians mm. would have been better for sure yeah Good. well I started it on a basic question I want to end it on a basic question as well because the novices mm. want it um, Paramount was originally the original distributor before it was moved over to Netflix. So, does a different distributor for a film have an effect on how the film effectively comes out? How it's, or is it just they finance it and the film gets made in the same way and it's completely out of their hands? What, what was the original distributor, sorry? Paramount. Paramount, okay. And then it moved over to Netflix. Okay, well, the fact, if it's a Netflix release, right, it's normally the emphasis won't, or the financial emphasis won't be on the theatrical release. So mm -hmm. that, that means a film could be longer. It could be, um, it could basically suit audiences not going to the theatre. But in this specific case, I, I can't really see how that plays out too much. Although it okay. depends also at what point that distributor's involved. Because um, if, if, you know, sometimes films can be, purchased almost after the fact mm -hmm. right over net netflix famously does this a lot netflix will buy a film after it's already been made by other producers and so on so it, it depends at what stage their kind of involvement came to be so with killers of flower moon my understanding is that apple tv were involved very early on right so um their involvement would have obviously trickled down into the actual production and, and i'm talking from pre-production all the way to post-production but if Netflix are involved after the film's been shot, and I don't know if this is the case, but if it's yeah. been if they get involved after the film's been shot, and Paramount decide we're not going to distribute and Netflix distribute instead, the the, the difference would be negligible in terms of you know that final cut. I can't I can't really believe that Netflix would would have any would make any changes to it. But for, that is a tricky question. It depends on the details. Depends are key on what here. stage. Yeah, the details are key here. But, but to, I mean, 
more more sort of universally someone like netflix could could easily obviously if they're if they're in from an earlier stage to, to echo what Ron said obviously their 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 business is obviously streaming and at the moment they're obviously very keen to get things like oscars and and, and bafta nominations because what they're obviously kind of fighting with is the sort of the nolans of the world who will say look cinema is key cinema is king and what they don't want is the sense that if a film comes out on netflix it it doesn't warrant an oscar right and obviously with this they've pushed it so hard and obviously it's from the top down this is an oscar bait movie make no you know this is this is an attempt by netflix by bradley cooper by all those that sort of team to obviously get this in the oscars limelight and they've pushed it in every single angle right um and for netflix that's the most important film this is probably almost like a lost leader for them right because they get to say that we've put our hands in the oscars honeypot um even though it's a movie that you know it's not going to do as well for them as you know stranger things or whatever but you know it is their sort of claim to fame because if this wins anything it will follow on from other films and they'll say look streaming makes good movies right so they can mm. kind of quash that theory so yeah it depends it's, yeah. it's complicated though but it depends on the sort of specifics of that deal I mean, well, what is clear they're, they're clearly fellating that little oscar statuette Oh yeah, yeah. It's hard, even hard, anyone hard who call. anyone who goes on the app is like Oscar nominee. You know, they they they. That's the big um, selling point now. Yeah. For sure. Well, actually, one more other little bit of information that I wanted to give you about with regards to Mr. Bradley Cooper is that apparently he's noted for having no chairs policies on set. So apparently Cooper doesn't like the idea of people loitering around his set and uh, as if they're not doing anything important. That's a bit. He just seems like he's micromanaging. This guy sounds like a fucking nightmare. He doesn't have a director's chair. He has a no chair policy. He has a no chair policy. So he doesn't like the idea of people just walking around his set um, if they're not doing something important. Apparently. I've seen it from two sources as well. If he directed a good. If he directed good movies, I'd. I'd think that that was a good, but clearly people need to sit to make good movies. So he's. I, I mean, if Chess is the answer, the, the, the logic doesn't make sense. Yeah, he needs sure. to bring. He needs he to bring. Like he needs to go to nightmare. DFS. He needs to go to needs, DFS to before the next to movie. Bulk, bulk buy a whole fucking load of <laughs> yeah. chairs. I want to see him in IKEA next week. D- oh. Just <laughs> chairs galore, and then the next movie is gonna actually. Be Imagine good. if he introduces chairs and it's like. He wins 10 Oscars next year. He's got 10 Oscars to his name. I mean, th- 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 he sounds like I, I, an absolute nightmare to work It surprises with. me, you know, when people come out with, they they will make, I, I can see the logic behind, you know, whoever, whichever fucking PR idiot put that fact out and to yeah. make it seem like Bradley Cooper, he's not just like, you know, he's not just this like He's not just a director, the writer, yeah. the main actor, like, the second actor, getting, the he's chair. He's getting into the nitty gritty <laughs> of it and so on and so forth. Listen, all directors have got different rules and, and you know, I, at the end of the day, we can only judge the, the final product. So, yeah, I think it, if if he were to make a great film and you said to me, look, if you said to me like, oh, look, Kubrick doesn't let people hold a pen, I'd be like, okay, I don't know why, but Obviously, he's making. He's doing bagging, something. Right? Yeah, he's doing so something. So right? there must be something about the pen. That's, but in this case, it goes over my head, right? Because you yeah. know, people they must. Do you have guys tired have legs. any specific rules that you like uh, to have on set? Well, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Have we ever? Have we ever set a rule room? Our productions have only been, you know, in that way. They, they, they're, they're pretty. They're pretty streamlined. I mean, to be honest, it'll be nice just to people for people to fill our chairs. Just random strangers just yeah. to sit down and yeah. Unfortunately, we've never had a big enough team to have stragglers. You know, not, that, not the... yet. Give it time. Don't worry. The podcast's going to. But pick I think up. that there will be there will be rules that will definitely come. No, out of course, and and sure. No, but you have to remember. I mean, to just kind of. I mean, we end this. I mean, in my opinion, the f- the film's a bit of a bust. But just to, the topic of production, um, people sometimes don't don't remember that if you've got, let's say, you've got. a large scale production we're talking hundreds of millions budget or even in the millions necessarily it doesn't have to be hundreds of millions um as soon as you get to the set let's say you've got um maybe even hundreds of people doing various jobs as soon as you hit play let's say and, and not not play in the sense of you the camera's rolling but once you're on that set everyone there's got a job and everyone's getting paid and obviously the studio the last thing they want is to see a bill of like you know 650 million pound and they're like well sorry what the fuck have you been doing so obviously the director 
with you know ads and and Rowan mentioned people like line producers and stuff they've got to obviously keep it compact and 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 working well because the last thing you want is you've got 20 sound people who they haven't been given their job properly yet they're stragglers but they're still getting yeah. paid so sort of money's going out of the you know f- flying out to, for nothing basically um so one of the big things is the director has to use their um you see their knowledge of the whole set has to use in a sense maybe even their charm but also their authority to sort of keep it keep it flowing right because everyone's going to have that same direction yeah. whilst also keeping in mind that obviously there's there's money at stake so we mentioned that nolan he shoots quickly right he's got this massive imax camera it's costing thousands and thousands for every scene right he can't just go back and be like let's amend that slightly he needs to keep it going and going and going so stuff like that is super important but in the case of this I think I think Cooper still he's 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 far behind. I, I don't think he's. I'm not going to put him up there with the the big directors. So whatever he's doing, I'm I'm not copying it. So oh, sorry, Bradley, again. Dennis and Bradley right. sitting in the tree. And that brings us uh, <laughs> that brings us to a nice a nice ending. I have no more questions. That's all the novices okay. had for me for this week. Well, shit off then. What are you still doing here? <laughs> Are we reviewing it then? Are we giving it scores? Let's do a review. All right, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit deflated about this film, but anyway, yeah. we can we can round up. Round Paul up. thinks next week though, so. <clears throat> All right. Okay. We should go. Um, I'll, I'll revive my spirits a bit. Bye. Yeah. So let's, let's go. I'm gonna give it a three out of ten. I'm gonna give it a three out of ten. Because can we get a sound effect of like ooh? I, I'll put something up. Can we, <laughs> can, can we re- cut? Can we retake that again? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get back into the scene. Okay. Good. I'm gonna give it three out of ten. <laughs> yeah. Although, because that insert effect. Yeah. Go. I'm gonna give it one for the cinematography. I'm gonna give it another one because it actually introduced me more to Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> that's a, that's a of a twist. <laughs> oh, no, give, one I'm piece of bread one. for your mother. <laughs> uh, Leonard Bernstein, uh, because I don't know who he was. So then, but I, the guy had uh, you had nothing involved with the actual film. No, but <laughs> yeah, me to, a, but I'm gonna watch his work outside of him. So fuck my show. His imaginary fucking, ghost but, hanging yeah. over Bradley Cooper's <laughs> Bradley Cooper's Bradley Cooper's fiance. Yeah. So. Introduced me to him, even though nothing to do with him. I'll obviously focus on his work outside of this and all the staff that had to fucking, you know, get coffees, <laughs> cables, <laughs> sound, all that kind of stuff. Any stuff. All the people on payroll. All the people on payroll. Get off their ass and go into three, the fucking set three every out day. Ten. Yeah. Yeah. There's m- chunks of information missing from the film, which is completely irrelevant. I would rather know more about his early life, how we got into music, when's the first time he even fucking touched the piano. Um, and his relationship with his father, who, who he dreams about, as opposed to you know his wife who's throwing up because she's got cancer, or she has a, uh, uh, she's having dinner with uh, Leonard's sister, saying, "Oh, the new suitor is also gay." Is well. I- irrelevant, completely irrelevant for me. So there's a chunks of this missing, and you cannot get over the Bradley Cooper wall. You know, this is Bradley Cooper mm. being Bradley Cooper in every single aspect of it. Um, so that's why I'm going to give it a three out of ten, and even that's generous. Okay, okay. You want to hit us yeah, up, Ryan, fine. with your review? Uh, to be honest, I, I agree with so much you're saying. I'll give it a three as well, and I'm not. That's that was a number I came up with all on my own. Oh so, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> so so far six. That's this total is going to be is going to be tiny. Yeah. Uh, um, my but but just my final thoughts. I think it's obviously too much of a. Crit- it's trying to be a critical darling uh, mm. and it's kind of just it, it's not really you know it's it's not it, it's almost entitled it has an entitled feeling you know it's like this is the academy this is the academy film this is the one that's going to win before they've actually made the film and the film is fucking lame so um i had big problems with the editing i had big problems with the 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 screenwriting and bradley cooper literally i couldn't i couldn't not see him the bradley cooper wall that was that was veritable. With the Carrie Mulligan, I thought was amazing though. Yeah, just within just within that role, she she's really good. Yeah, I, I agree. She has this br- profound like cuteness. You know, 
She kind of looks like Miss Honey. Okay, meets this sounds like, like a, a personal fucking preference. Meets, meets like, <laughs> it's, she she looks a bit like Piglet from, from Winnie the Pooh as well. Um, why is he he's, not replying to about any of her, my DMs? Nice. And I've heard I'm that she's recently sure. single. Yeah. <laughs> um, we forgot, but, but despite, we didn't even but, talk about Sarah that. Silverman in the film. Um, for the most annoying, grating role ever. Well, who, who is um, that? She plays, plays the sister. sister. Of Le- Lenny says oh, right. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, right. Um, so, what did you give it? A, a three, right? Three. Yeah. Okay, so that's, yeah. Mm. Three. This is a bit annoying, right? Because I was going to give it a three, but are we going to get three, three, threes across the board? It's fine, yeah. it's fine. There's nothing wrong with uh, synchronicity. Okay, all right. Fine. In that case, in that case, yeah, I have to go with a three. I, I actually thought about. Doesn't even make double digits. I actually thought, <laughs> actually thought about giving it a two earlier on, but. Obviously, I, I I admire almost kind of a bit like Barley did. I kind of admire a few key points of it, um, and there is that element where, at the very least, it doesn't you know it doesn't look completely shit, right? But ultimately, it's just uh, it's a it's, it's a lot of nothingness in it, you know. And for someone who, I mean, Leonard Bernstein, and it's sort of I'm touched upon in the film, but. For someone who's obviously so exuberant, so passionate about his his art form, and obviously we mentioned that scene at the end with the young student. In those moments, his passion sort of reeks. You know, it bleeds out. You know, it's it's interesting to watch, but the rest of the film is never able to capture it. And the reason it isn't is because obviously Bradley Cooper he kind of goes on his quest to make this the Bradley Cooper show, and it's a shame because it would have been beautiful to watch a film about just how passionate and exuberant he is as a composer and conductor and everything um so for me it's so wide off the mark that yeah it's i don't know crazy that it's nominated but yeah three three out of ten okay right. that's a resounding <clears throat> pile of shit from the scrutinized discipline. yeah, <laughs> right. yeah um, to add, yeah, to add not recommending point, yeah. to add another point when um from that interview because i had to watch it before before we made the show uh where bradley cooper is sitting with Leonard's kids and at one point he, he starts crying he goes I miss him and one of the kids points out you never met him <laughs> so what the fuck have you missed <laughs> it's like you know what that interview is like and Ron you should link that on but that interview is a bit like do you remember that kid that went missing and they said that he got taken by a balloon or whatever and the dad has to sit in the interview and bullshit and I can see the other members of the family they've obviously been fucking paid a fuckload by this you know this whole movie <laughs> scheme mm-hmm. right and yeah. they're sat there being like what the fuck is he talking about? Like, what? It's getting to the point where it's like, this is not even. I mean, like, this is insane. Him, he's like, I miss him. I don't know what it fucking, is. <laughs> they must be thinking this batshit guy. He's a millionaire actor. Just go back to your yacht and stop, stop doing this. Like, um. But yeah. Anyway, put a big poo emoji on this one. And this... okay, but I've got a quick question. If uh, as Bradley Cooper, you know, seems to be trying to fill a musician type role, right? What do you think he's gonna do next? Or could well, he do next? He's done. Sh- he did sh- he's done chef. Um, he's done him playing a chef. Yeah, he yeah. basically he's chooses. Sn- he's done sniper, obviously, an American sniper. He always chooses things where he comes across as very cool and and like in his mind, sort of quasi sexy, right? Because he's done a chef. He's done a yeah. He's done the sniper. Well, I actually think he he the performance in that is actually pretty good, and I think that's actually not. A, it has problems, but I don't overly dislike American Sniper. But he's done chef. He's done sniper. He's done Rockstar. He's done Leonard Bernstein, so composer, conductor. But, but which role is he going to craft next, for himself next? I think next he's going to do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A podcast. He's gonna. He's gonna. I think he's gonna play Joe Rogan next. That's my feeling. He's gonna bulk up. He's gonna shave his head, and he's gonna like, Jamie pull that up. That's gonna be the trailer. It's gonna feature. <laughs> the, it's gonna be the Super Bowl. It's gonna be him. And he's gonna be like Jamie pull that up, and the audience is gonna go mental. I think that's gonna be it. Mark my words. Okay. Okay. Are we bitten on this or what? what? <laughs> we thought we heard a pile of shit with that film and now Dennis with that with that comment. Fuck me. No, to be honest, I, I would watch, watch that film. I'd give it more So than would I, stars. actually. I'd, 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 I mean, it's not difficult for it to be better than it would Because it would either be good or, or it would either be entertainingly bad. It wouldn't be anywhere yeah, in the yeah. middle. It would just be one of those two. Um, but um, to end on a more important note... Um, I had a little dream where next to our video, there's a little subscribe button and there's loads of little people that are swimming and trying to touch it and they just couldn't. Um, but I'm here to say that if you try hard enough, you can. So press that button 
and leave a little comment. Tell us what do you think of of Barty in general? Because me and Rowan are starting to hate him. But um, <laughs> you tell us if that's just us two, or, or if that's kind of a sort of global thing. Maybe we could even start a little cult against against Barty. But we do that all in the comments. Whoa, um, whoa, yeah. whoa! So that's a yeah, bit, let that's us know. Be open minded. Me and the novices are going to come back. Let me tell you right now. <laughs> in the comments the, the, the little subterranean race of no- novices <laughs> yeah but all they're just gonna, smurfs are all about they're going to come out it's going to be like a bug's life they're all going to come out and fight us you know, above ground they all live in the sewers like Futurama there's that ratatouille <laughs> and they all mutants. come out of the kitchen and little fridge and just rats coming out everywhere that's going to be me me and the, and the novices there's no <laughs> us, you know, so when we stack up, honestly, there's no better way to end this episode the, the novices come in smurf form because I'm pretty sure we've established that from now on no, 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 that was just for last episode. We're not doing that again, are we? Boss, man. <laughs> okay, we'll see about that. <laughs> guys, it's been a we'll pleasure, guys. Enough. Okay, All right, guys. peace out. That was fun. Hey, Bye-bye. Take care. See ya. And um, don't watch the film. If anyone's listening, don't watch the fucking film. <laughs> <Don't watch it. laughs> Word of warning. <laughs> Word of warning, don't watch the fucking film. Honestly, I can sum it up in two minutes. It's Bradley Cooper. Don't.